Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts here today be a pleasant offering, a sweet aroma in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The size of the world changes throughout the course of life. When we are infants, our world is our crib. Things might happen out beyond it, but all that we know is what we can see and touch. The blankets keeping us warm, the mobile dancing above our head, and those wooden posts protecting us from all the harm outside. As we grow older, the world expands beyond our home to the very street we live on. We spend time at our neighbors playing basketball with their kids. We go to neighborhood functions, we jump rope and play hide and go seek in our neighbors' yards. Then we go to school and our little corner of the world gets even bigger. The hallways, cafeteria, gymnasium, all of these become like home to us too. We spend about as much time in school learning and growing and making friends as we do at home and on the street where we used to play. Our world grows and we get to see that life is more than just us. As we grow and move away from home or travel on vacation, we get to experience entirely new worlds. Far from our childhood street, we plant new roots and start over, and our world keeps getting bigger. This is ever-shifting, ever-growing, and it also happens in the Bible. Way back in Genesis, humanity first meets God in a garden we call Eden. Their God invites the first of us to name all the trees and flowers and animals and caretake over this garden, just like God is nurturing and caretaking over us. And after some time, the first humans left the garden and headed into the big open world. In fact, the overarching narrative of Scripture is a journey from one place to another, from one world to another. For Moses and the tribes of Israel, their journey was from the land of Egypt, where they were enslaved, to the land of freedom, the land of milk and honey, the land of Israel. For the Israelites, their story was wrapped up in learning how to live in that little corner of the world that God was preparing for them. Then we go to the New Testament, to the Gospels, where we start off in a manger in Bethlehem, and we go on a journey with Jesus all over the land of Israel, from the Sea of Galilee to the villages of the Samaritans all the way to Jerusalem and eventually to the cross and the tomb. And with each stop along the journey, our scope of the world grows and we learn something new about God and ourselves. In our Gospel lesson for this morning, we meet Mary Magdalene right outside of the tomb where they had named Jesus after his death. Now the Sabbath had ended and she ran out to see where his body was, but he was not there, at least not in the way she expected. A man she thought was a gardener approached her and asked, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Mary frantically responded, Sir, if you knew where they had carried him away to, tell me and I will go and get them. But right then the stranger looked into her eyes and whispered her name, Mary. And she realized it was not a gardener, it was her Savior. And she hugged 
him so tightly, and eventually Jesus invited her to go and tell the rest of the disciples the good news, that he was yet alive. We would never see everyone. You would think the disciples would be shouting the good news of Scripture from the rooftops, the good news of Easter, but they would be going two by two to the ends of the world. But quite the opposite. As we go to where they are staying in that same upper room where they had only recently shared the Last Supper with Jesus, we walk up the stairs and find the door to their room is locked. And not just locked, it is barred shut with all types of furniture blocking the door. The disciples had shut themselves up from the world and were living in a way that many of us are doing right now, isolating ourselves from others. But none of this stops Jesus. He doesn't bang on the doors, pleading to be let in. He doesn't yell and demand that they open up. He simply walks through all the barriers in his way and stands before them humbly and with love and with open arms. And surely, as they look bewildered, he goes up to each and every one of them and holds them in the palm of his hand and says, My beloved, peace be with you. Receive the Holy Spirit and be at peace. And maybe you'll agree our scope of the world has gotten smaller in these recent days. As of now, the parsonage is my home and it is my world. I might go on a walk to stretch my legs or to the store to pick up groceries, but for the most part, our home is our world. And while we are home, we are safe. And I believe, just like with the first disciples, Jesus is finding his way past all the locked doors and closed windows and all the levels of fear right to where we are wherever we are calling home during this time. And he isn't coming to save the day or to tell us it will all be over soon or even that we should leave where we are. He is simply coming to tell us words of peace. But while he is here, while he is with us, while he is making a home with us during our stormy present. I believe this is our opportunity to turn whatever corner of the world that we call home into a garden, just like the first humans did. We may live in a one-bedroom apartment or a grand mansion, but regardless, while we are spending our days in isolation, let us spend our time making our little corner of the world beautiful. Invite Jesus to fill your home with love. Let in fresh air clean and spruce the place up. Light candles and cook delicious food. Spend time with your pets and on the phone with your loved ones, sharing words of peace with them. And before you know it, people might just mistake you for a gardener and your home for paradise. Peace be with you. And for this reason, I say,